I don't believe in black majority rule ever in Rhodesia. Not in a thousand years. I think it will be a disaster for Rhodesia. Whether you like it or not, you are subject to the whims of these filthy little murderers, these black barbarian savages, because that's what they are. This is the voice of Zimbabwe. Pamberi Nechimurenga. Pamberi Nehondo. Pamberi Nerujinjirwe Zimbabwe. People of Zimbabwe, victory is certain. Maputo, headquarters of the largest guerrilla army at the height of the war for Rhodesia. We filmed there two years ago when Robert Mugabe and his followers were labelled by the world as terrorists. I'm very understand. I'm very understand. Rural committee. I'm very. High command. I'm very. There was the whole history of our having tried non-violent methods. They had failed completely, and neither the uh, settler regime nor Britain heeded our cries. They just uh, uh, wouldn't move. They wouldn't yield. And if the Western press was unenthusiastic. I just don't care what they say, as long as I know I'm right. So they can say anything in their papers, uh, damage me in every way possible, as long as the people I lead are behind me and approve of what we are doing. That's what matters. The rest of the world will one day, you see, be uh, uh, persuaded to believe we were right. Two years later, Mugabe's new home, the Prime Minister's residence, Salisbury. Ian Smith's worst fears have been realised. Mugabe, socialist revolutionary, has been elected by universal franchise. But in these early days, the revolution is remarkably restrained. At Mr and Mrs Smith's old home, not a lot has changed. President Comrade Brezhnev yesterday ordered a categoric denial to be made in New Delhi of reports that Soviet troops have entered... This film is a glimpse behind the scenes of a government that's had the eyes of a sceptical world on it since it came to power last April. By killing John Lennon, he will become the 40-year-old ex -leader. It's somehow a remarkably British revolution. At the Prime Minister's office and the finest traditions of the British civil service, the advisers who brief Mugabe at the start of each day include men who advised Ian Smith when he commanded the war against Mugabe. Last week, Mr Mugabe dismissed General Walls from his position as army commander after accusing him of making statements which had done a great deal of harm to Zimbabwe. That was the full quote. Quote from? From the BBC. We don't forget had uh, had no experience in running a government and uh, uh, it sounded uh, like a dream you know when we won the elections and uh, not that we didn't expect to win but that uh, the reality of independence had come sooner than we we had anticipated we had thought that we would uh, through armed struggle achieve victory perhaps in 18 1981 or 1982 but uh, it had come uh, earlier than that. And so we needed, I needed support. I needed even the support of my former enemies who now had transformed into allies. Previously, we had hoped that um, the war would go on until final victory. Well, if that had happened, then obviously we wouldn't have Ian Smith here. Uh, we would never have had General Walls and uh, quite a number of people would have been brought to trial. But um, it's not the way the things went. And perhaps we are glad that the things have taken this political trend towards the end of the armed struggle. That's the, the solution on the handy. The cabinet, 18 members of Mugabe's party, ZANU, four posts for his major political rival, Joshua Nkomo, and two for Ian Smith's Rhodesia Front in a government of national reconciliation. Quite a number of 
ministers are abroad on various duties. And in Parliament, a black speaker. Didymus Mutasa, once jailed for establishing a multiracial community called Cold Comfort Farm, where blacks and whites lived and worked together as equals. There's nothing much on the order paper today. So far as we know, there are no notices of motions. Uh, that's the, for the that's adjournment the of the debate. Yes, it could be withdrawn, which I've put here, and Mr. Micklem will beg leave to withdraw. To withdraw yes. yes. So don't forget to look at him when the minister has finished speaking. Fine. Uh, and that should all be very simple this afternoon. I'm sure everything will be perfectly all right and yes. you'll manage very well. Fine. Don't forget to straighten your wig before you go down. Fine, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> A Westminster model parliament in place of the one-party state that Mugabe and his followers have acknowledged they'd prefer. Instead, Didymus Mutasa, after three years in jail and then in exile labelled as a terrorist, is now deferred to by black and white MPs alike with a graciousness that would put many British parliamentarians to shame. But how long will these gentilities last? Or is a one-party state just around the corner? No, it isn't. Uh, we are committed to the Lancaster House Agreement, and it is because of that agreement that we have a situation where um, there are various parties represented in our parliament. There are not that many, actually. Uh, but um, um, in spite of that multi-party um, system which the Lancaster House has yielded. Uh, my party is virtually in control. There is no need for us really to think of a one-party state. Is there any debate? Mr. Chairman, I believe it is true to say that the security situation within Zimbabwe is as bad at the moment as it has ever been. The life of the individual has, I believe, not been eased to any marked degree, nonsense. if at all. That's if one considers the problem of the people of this country dividing, the consequences of that are too dreadful for law-abiding citizens to contemplate. That is the sort of stupid, ignorant, ridiculous remark that causes more trouble than, uh, than anything else. Nonsense. Mr. Chairman, if the honourable members over there do not wish to listen to me, I suggest they leave the chamber. Sir, I am absolutely terrified and horrified at the moment... Would the chair mind asking that gentleman over there, and I use the term extremely loosely, to um, withdraw that remark? What was he called me a monkey. I've been called an elephant and now a monkey. I wish they'd make up their mind. <laughs> It's all a very far cry from Mozambique, isn't it? It is, indeed. Absolutely so. So if you could choose, you wouldn't dress up like that, I take Absolutely it? Absolutely not. At all. If I had to choose, I'd really choose something that is traditional, something that is African. And every time that I'm presiding, uh, very funny thoughts come to my mind um, that, you know, I'm really presiding uh, over a house of uh, people who a few 
months ago were referring to each other as terrorists and fascists. It's not that long since Africans were jailed for demanding representation in Parliament. Mugabe himself was in prison without trial for 11 years. This is the first time Mugabe has returned here since he was a prisoner. Yes, they are complaining. Yes, I slept here. Yeah. The carrier was here, I think. And then Sitole was sleeping here. We did our cleaning here by turns. Only Sitole didn't do any cleaning. And your bed was where? My bed was just here. What did you do during the day? How on earth did you find ah, time? We studied here. We had our books piled next to us. We read throughout the day. I got three degrees here. Yes. You got three degrees from the cell? Yes. <laughs> What do you feel as you come back and look at this? What emotions come run back? through you? Well, mixed memories, really. One that, although I was in prison, it was not in vain. But another that uh, prison is a horrible institution. Is there still a touch of bitterness in you as you look back on all those, in a sense, wasted years? No, really, I will. It's, just, uh, it's, it's a chunk that is gone out of one's life. But uh, what do you do about it? But uh, you had a cause to fight for. And those in power felt uh, they had uh, their own cause to defend. And this is it. It, it, it happens. Uh, this is... You can't lament over that. You, you can't allow yourself, yourself to be bitter. We played uh, table tennis or drafts, a game of drafts. But we also had slabs. Yes, this is ours. We used to play this. You see, there were two of them. We actually had this made. I used to be very good at it. Maurice Nyagumbo. He's now the Minister of Mines. Minister of Mines. Nkala also, and Tekere too, to some extent. But I think I was, I, I, I used to be the, the best. Yes, we used to peer through here too. to the garden. Did you play table tennis? Yes, I did. But uh, uh, Morton Malianga was, uh, and did Musmutasa, when we are still at Didmus Mutasa. They were the champions, yes. So uh, I wasn't very good here. I was good there. <laughs> Did you ever feel like escaping? Did you ever try to escape? Why escape? Run away from one. That's the one thing I never, never would have wanted to do. Even if I'd been left alone in an open place. I had a cause to fight for. And um, being put in prison was a challenge, a test of my determination and commitment to uh, the cause and running away would have proved me a coward anyway. I did. I never thought of running away at all. Yeah. Some of your close friends were executed while you were here. What effect did that have on you when your colleagues were hanged? Um, each time a person was going to be hanged, we were told about it. And of course, the atmosphere became very um, uh, a solemn one in that. Uh, People were not allowed to go out for that morning. They were to sit um, uh, and sit at uh, given places and uh, remain quiet. It was a terrible thing. So you see, hanging a person is, is a deliberate act. Um, it's not um, the same act as 
you know, shooting a person in uh, a fight. Uh, although that is deliberate, but then there is the cause behind it. But really for um, a sane community to decide that um, because certain persons are guilty of uh, um, um, capital offences, we must perform a deliberate act of hanging them up. That, that I can't, I can't uh, uh, reconcile myself to. There'll be no hangings while you're Prime Minister? Um, I don't think there will be. I don't think there will be. Um, one doesn't know what happens uh, in future, but really this type of uh, machine we would have. It is quite an attractive appeal when people cry for vengeance and that kind of thing. But if you really proceed to be vengeful and to start the campaign of uh, persecuting your enemies, where does it end? The cock, election symbol of the ZANU party. <laughs> ZANU, having won the countryside in war, will not now relinquish it in peacetime. The people here are still suspicious of the police and other agents of the government, and though Mugabe needs to re-establish the rule of law, he's reluctant to undermine the hold his party has. Mrs Mugabe has proved to be an effective campaigner in her own right. party's headquarters, where unemployed comrades back from the bush still mill around aimlessly, Sally Mugabe has the job of helping them come to terms with peace. Forgive they will, but to forget now. Because there are certain horrible occurrences that one can never forget. I know a comrade who fell into an attack, and during the attack, two friends of hers were injured and all she saw was one of her friends lying down with no leg. Then she looked round and found her friend bleeding, but did not notice the friend did not have a leg. Then later on she looked the other direction and saw the leg by itself. So her friend started shouting, please carry me, please carry me and take my leg too, the friend said. That was terrible. Then she carried the friend on her back and then started looking for the leg, carried the leg on the other hand. So the friend told her, I think we should throw away the leg because it's already useless. Then this friend started crying. You can't do that. Please carry my leg. Do I want my leg? It took a lot of persuasion for her to know that the leg was no use. We must bury it. Then later on, they decided to bury it. Instances like that, who will forget? Forgive you can. Yes, we are all trying to forgive, you know, but to forget is difficult. <laughs> Here, several hundred schoolchildren are back home in Zimbabwe from exile in Zambia and Mozambique. This is a transit camp, and they've been waiting here for three months to get back to their villages. Vandalism has been rife. Now, at last, schools have been made ready, transport is available, and a new government minister, Kumbirai Kangai, has come to see them off. A quarter of a million refugees have come home in the last nine months. <laughs> What's happened to their families, their mothers and fathers? Well, unfortunately, um, some of them no longer have any, you know, parents. Uh, they were either killed during the war, and uh, others have disappeared right now. They don't know really where they've gone to, whether they uh, moved to the urban areas uh, as displaced people in the area, running away from the war, or they're in some corner of the country. We don't know. So they're not just refugees, they're effectively orphans? They definitely, yes. <laughs> 
the return to peace hasn't always been so joyous or so simple. Here, at a gold mine near a military assembly point, the manager's house was attacked in the night for no obvious reason. With, uh, with it bending like that, it stretched, it actually oh, stretched yes. the metal and it was pointless trying to bang it out, so it was best putting in a new frame. No, quite. It was one no, of dozens is, uh, of outbreaks of violence by trigger-happy young guerrillas who now find peace harder to cope with than war. It happened at approximately 10 o'clock at night. My wife and I had only just got to bed. Our lights were still on. There was a shatter of glass and a terrific commotion of small arms fire. And one's natural reaction is to hit the ground as fast as possible and return fire. It was only after the attack had finished that I was able to walk around amidst broken glass to find out that we'd actually been hit by a rocket and that the house was uh, in rather a poor state. What does it make you feel about staying on here? Well, it doesn't make much of a change. I'll still stay on. What with people rocketing your house for no apparent reason? Well, there have been other people in exactly the same position as myself. After all said and done, I am Rhodesian, born and bred. I'm now a Zimbabwean, working for the country, operating a foreign currency earning unit, and I have no intention of moving out. If somebody can say that there are better places, I'd like to see them. This is one of the most troublesome assembly points, and these men are the key to Zimbabwe's future. After 12 months of mounting boredom and frustration, only 12,000 of the 34,000 guerrillas of Mugabe and Como's armies have been integrated with the old Rhodesian forces. The military is consuming a third of the nation's budget. The heroes of war, as in all wars, have become an embarrassment in peacetime. But the Prime Minister has been advised to stay away. This is his first visit since independence. First and foremost, what everybody now looks um, up to government for is the ability to establish peace. I'm very concerned about these incidents which are occurring. I think it's just some frustration which has set in in some of the assembly points, not in all. I feel um, the need exists for us to accelerate the pace um, for a uh, pace of integrating Zanla, Zipra, and the former Rhodesian forces. As long as these people are in assembly points, frustration is bound to set in. In Bulawayo, when violence flared between Mugabe and Como's men, 55 people died. It was a hint of the underlying danger of civil war. If we had integrated our forces earlier, we would not have had the Bulawayo incident. At least it would not have been that ugly. The elements which are perpetrating these acts, who have gone dissident, are doing us disservice. And uh, it is um, uh, our duty to ensure that they are uh, apprehended and brought to justice. This is the National Security Council, responsible for law and order. 
Mugabe needs to be seen to be acting even-handedly, but after the Bulawayo riots, nine of Nkomo's top men were arrested. Nkomo, though Minister of Home Affairs, was neither told nor consulted. Their relationship now is said to be severely strained. Many cynics thought we couldn't work together. Uh, many people never thought that there could be any peace at all and, and, and that uh, the, the guerrillas will be shooting everybody around and so on and so forth. Shootings have taken place, but not to the extent that the people thought they would, they would take place. You and your supporters must have been bitterly disappointed that you didn't get a greater measure of power. Have you and your party come to terms with that? Well, uh, people say we were greatly disappointed, but of course normally as a party you want to be in power. But the point is this, they, they forget that we didn't fight just to be in power. We fought that the country be free, be independent. We've got that. That's the main thing. There are people are on people's at times say we lost. I said, no, we didn't lose. We got the main thing. And the main thing is independence. Independence has come for good. Governments come and go. So we have one real thing we've set ourselves to achieve, and that is an independent and sovereign Zimbabwe. Across the country, the alliance between Nkomo and Mugabe is still fragile. And with latent tribal jealousies, the failure of the coalition could be catastrophic. In Nkomo's Matabili land are some of the poorest corners of the country, and there's a danger that the people here will feel forgotten. It's the rural areas that suffered most cruelly in the war, yet so far they've seen little change since independence. There were four kraals here, burned by the security forces, but there's no straw to rebuild them. There's been precious little aid, and worse still, the rains have failed. This simple borehole, vital to survival, has remained unrepaired for six months. For the village committee here of Nkomo's party, this will be one of the first tests of whether the new government in faraway Salisbury deserves their support or not. We have got no water for so many weeks. People are suffering about six to three, seven miles away, trying to get some water, but we try to S uh, report this problem to the DC, but we never succeed. Nothing's ever happened? Nothing ever happened. Some people have said that you in the Patriotic Front, Mr Nkomo's supporters, don't like the present government and would like a civil war. Is that true? No, it's, it's untrue. <laughs> you want to live in peace? Yes, we want to live in peace. Even under a ZANU-PF coalition government? Coalition government is right. It's as right. long as it can bring us something, a good changes to the people, for the people. We don't care whether color, language, whatsoever. We need a help to the people, for the people. Water is a life. It's the only a life, is the water. Water is our life. The most outspoken advocate for change is one of Mugabe's most radical and controversial ministers who's narrowly escaped conviction in a famous murder trial, Edgar Tikiri. Do you feel somewhat impatient at the way things are going? Do you feel that there should be faster <coughs> changes, more radical changes, perhaps? Oh, I think even uh, Comrade Mugabe himself uh, very often is suffering lots of strain because he's feeling frustrated. Things are not moving as fast as they ought to, and uh, he's... Uh, He's all the time trying to throw out his fingers to put, his, uh, to put them on uh, threads of leads, you know, to quick change. I like quick change. The way I analyze it is very simple. We were out in the bush. We sacrificed many young men and women. Many of them are dead. Many of them are maimed. You know, shooting out a war. Bullets are very fast things. We caused these parents to commit their young daughters and their young sons. Now we have come. The war has stopped. The bullets have stopped. Is it not natural that the population that gave its uh, young uh, sons and daughters should expect things to move fast, although not as fast as the bullet, but pretty fast. 
This is what I mean by the process of the revolution. We taught the people that there must be quick change. And we said, you give us sacrifice because we want quick change. And in fact, it is to, ve to be very liberal to say we want it now, because we want it yesterday. I know this uh, age-old argument. Don't disturb. You see, don't rock the boat. You see, but, uh, but uh, if, we, if we have uh, had so many decades of uh, um, underprivileged people, suppressed people, economically and politically. How do you go about that without rocking the boat? Go on with the people uh, going on as they have always gone on? Then whom, whom are we for? You see, it's commerce and industry for the people, and not people for the commerce and industry. No. You have government in Zimbabwe. Do you really feel you have power, proper power? We, we have power in, uh, in parliament. In uh, majorities in cabinet, but uh, physical power is, is is still something dicey. Economic power, mm -mm, no. And this is why the 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 process of the revolution must continue at a very fast rate. If anybody doesn't want to belong, get out. And let's uh, take fresh stock of who is, who, who is prepared to stay. And this goes for skilled men power, you see. If they are going to behave like spoiled children, you know, who want privilege all the time and uh, without any sense of belonging and without being people oriented, out they go. They don't belong here. We don't want them. Have you sometimes wished that some of your ministers had stayed silent rather than speaking out as openly as they have? They have made statements, I think, uh, which by and large um, have been salutary. They have been others, of course, which uh, tended to reflect um, the views of the individual minister. And this is because of the need which still exists on the part of uh, some of them to reconcile themselves to the reality of accepting uh, their former uh, opponents or enemies as allies. And. Um, it's therefore that uh, psychological state which uh, um, gives rise to some of the statements which um, the whites have found rather disconcerting. Do you think some of the whites have rather overreacted to these statements or do you have some sympathy with them when they're rather scared of what might happen? I think there has been some degree of uh, overreaction, but I do sympathize with um, them and I've had to appeal to some of their leaders to go more by government action than by uh, some of the statements which uh, they, they, they say cause um, uh, fear and despondency amongst them. So the whites have to be persuaded that their lifestyles are secure, while the blacks have to be convinced that change is coming fast. It's an almost impossible contradiction. At Kutama, Mugabe's birthplace, his old house is much as it was when he was a child. Life for his relations is much as it always was. The average income for peasant farmers is 20 pounds a year. They need access to education, but above all to new and better land. These are refugees, displaced by the old regime and now without land of their own. Squatting is commonplace in land owned by absentee white farmers. Nowhere is the contrast between blacks and whites stronger than in education. This is a black primary school being visited by the minister, Zingai Mutambuka. This school actually is educating 941 young Zimbabweans. So eight classrooms of this size, That's right. between them have 900, nearly 950 pupils. That's right. How's it done? <laughs> well, double sessioning. Some people come in the morning, some come in the afternoon. Tremendous crowding, you can see. Every little space available is being utilized. And this is a good African school by this Zimbabwe. This is a standards. typical African school. It's, it's really a very well-off school by Zimbabwean standards. It's a very well-off school. 
Only four out of ten African children have primary education of any sort at all. Even now, most black schools rely on charity, on the work of missionaries and volunteers. Despite the thirst for education, only one in 20 Africans will get to secondary school. This is absolutely incredible. Is this what we fought the war for? It's supposed to be some illegal school. Illegal government, what does it matter? It's the child who suffers. What happens to children who can't even find a place in this sort of school, which is the majority of them? I don't know. They, I suppose they just rot away. That's why we went to war. And these things still happen. It's, it's depressing, to say the least. <laughs> I wonder whether I have the right to call myself Minister of Education and Culture when things like this happen. This is another school of sorts. We have introduced free primary education. But these two teachers and their third colleague who is sick today, they are worried they don't like these children to walk the streets without being able to read and write. So they come here, they volunteer their time, their tasks, nobody so pays how are they getting paid? Nobody pays them. But even a great proportion of African children don't even have this level of education, No. Right? Something like... Um, 50% to 60% of African children actually never go to school. They don't even have this. They don't even have this. Just five miles away is what used to be an all-white private school. The new government has made it free. And put the textbook on top. Right, which is the best table. And you can see who's sitting up nicely. And they get two house points. Right, very quiet. You put those books. On the night that the election results were announced, whites were appalled at the result and, and extremely concerned at the problems that will exist with the Mugabe government. I th believe that there would be massive integration overnight. And I, th I, I felt that things would change dramatically within the space of a few months. And that standards would collapse? Oh, indeed. I think, uh, I think that was the, uh, the fear in most whites' uh, minds, that, that, that standards would fall away, that they'd be forced to leave the country because of falling standards in education, which is one of the three things, health, education and security, that whites were concerned about. In the event, what's happened here? Well, in the event, of course, the, the school's gone on as normal. There's been no problems. Integration has taken place gradually and uh, no problems at all. The school is functioning well, as good as it was two, three years ago. Are you being completely candid? Really, you've had no problems at all? No problems whatsoever. None at all. This is the average of any white school, Group A school. And is this free? It's completely free. It's completely free. There's no discrimination as against the child whether you are black or white, as long as you go to school. But the trouble, of course, is that so many black kids never go to school. It's the problem. So why don't you turn this back into a fee-paying school? Well, it's a question of the principle and policies of the government. We have said primary school education is free, irrespective of who you are, irrespective of your social background, irrespective of your ethnic origin. Primary school education in this country is free, no parent has to pay. This is a, a political position we are taking, and so we can't, you see, discriminate against children. It's not their fault, these children. It's us adults who made mistakes. So let us not penalize young people for our own mistakes. <laughs>
For the lucky few who get good schooling, Britain has traditionally provided scholarships for British universities, but now foreign student grants have been cut and the Zimbabweans are bitterly disappointed. It's not just the question of pounds and tens. Many of the people from the Commonwealth look up to Britain as the senior partner, as their kind of mecca, really, shall we say. And people have been educated there, some of us have been educated there, and you, get, you develop a certain tie with those countries. Now, what is going to happen is that the orientation of study is going to change, because if the Eastern Bloc countries offer us study facilities, we will definitely go. And gradually, over the years, you will build up a cadre who have their orientation in that direction. That will be their maker. And that is one thing the British should bear in mind. It's not just a question of pens and pounds. There is much more to it than meets the eye. Whatever aid comes from abroad, the new government in Salisbury must generate a prosperous economy if it's to pay for its reforms. They want free medical treatment for low-income Africans, but the whites won't tolerate their standards being lowered. Aspiring young Africans want work, but only one in three adult blacks now has a paid job. So far, Mugabe's following an economic policy that's much closer to that of the British Labour Party than that of Fidel Castro's Cuba. We realised that we had inherited an infrastructure which is principally capitalist, and that whatever socialist policies would want to implement, these policies had to take into account the economic background of the country, and that it wouldn't serve any purpose if we overthrew the system and uh, tried to build on a completely new social basis. We have not hidden our beliefs. We have said we derive our uh, socialist principles basically from Marxist-Leninist thinking. And we feel that um, there is um, a link uh, between Marxist-Leninist thinking and some of our uh, traditional collective um, ideas. And we are linking these together. But we also accept the uh, Christian principles that come into it, uh, the love that we should have for each other, um, good neighborliness, charity, and that, and that kind of thing. And on the basis of that, we uh, are evolving a philosophy which we believe will be acceptable to our own people. There is, of course, individualism in our traditional society, but uh, I think we would want to emphasize more the collective aspect, leaving room for individualism. This is how we look at it. Um, I am dead against injustice. That, uh, as an individual, um, I just can't stand. I can't stand um, being unfair to other people. <laughs> From this tobacco grading plant, people have complained to the ZANU party that they're ill-treated by the owner. A minister, Edison Zvobo, has decided to investigate. The owner has certainly been involved in violence, but his injuries come from a domestic quarrel with other whites. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm Dr. Zvobo from the Commonwealth. How did you do? Fine, thank you. Um, I came out to, uh, to see your farm. Yes, yes. Um, Stop it! You have quite some dogs here, don't you? Yes, 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 yes. yes. What, did they bite? No, no, no. They make a lot of noise. They make a lot of noise? Yes. Anyhow, I will tell you briefly why we are here. Yes. Um, I, I came out here because yesterday yes. I, had a, I had a rally. Yes. In, in waterfalls. Yes. Right. Yes. I had some of your workers with me at the meeting. Yes. They complained extremely bitterly about what they alleged yes. to be the kind of treatment they received here. Yes, yes. Uh, from you. Yes. Uh, they decided I, I come down and have a look. Could we have a look? Sure, sure, come on. Five hundred people live and work here, sorting and grading tobacco. Their pay is about one and a half Zimbabwean dollars for a ten to twelve hour working day. That's about two dollars thirty American, or one pound sterling. There's no trade union here to improve wages or conditions, and those who try to form a ZANU party committee 
complain of harassments and of sackings. At first, people were visibly afraid to speak out. Uh, they say, she says that, um, uh, and he does, and the others here, that you shupa them a lot, that you, you, you bother them here at work. And, and what way do you bother them? Ask them what way you bother them. Right. Why, why do you bother them? <laughs> And what way do you bother them? Taurajan, Taurajan. Huh? She says, um, you, you, you bother them because they get up at six and they work until six. You don't give them any break at all. Oh, no. And oh, what's no. worse, let me finish. Yes. What's worse, that you use foul language against them. Uh -huh. um, uh, you use bad language when, um, when, whenever you are issuing orders to, um, to your workers. Why, why and I, don't, I don't think I use bad language at all. The only time I do use bad language is if the tobacco is mixed. And now on this... And you use bad language. I, uh, Sometimes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so we all do when, yeah. when we get angry, don't we? Yeah, like... Now, now on this, let, let's turn around and take it this way. Mm. Uh, she says she works from 66. Now, there's some of the people here, uh, I don't close doors of anything like this. Uh. They go out, they have their meals, they have their tea, any time they want. <laughs> I don't give them tea. All right, all right. I don't give them tea. Oh, I see. I, I don't give them tea. No. No. No, no. I, I do not give them tea. No. No. But if they want to go out for the tea, mm. they go out, they have we're the friends, tea. Do a passport. Mm. Right. This is the bus boy. That's right, this is a bus boy. Eh, but why in the watch the Murungwa go no one needs Murungwa no needs a van, but no one go bus. Sina notice. He agrees with the people, he says you are bothersome. I'm bothersome? Murungwa no needs a notice. He says you, you dismiss people without notice. Today, Nasa Abdis. Today you dismiss the two people. A husband and a wife without that, notice? That, that, I dismissed them, yes. Uh, they are daily paid employees without, to get paid the notice, Where? which is one day. That, that, but one day. That's right. <coughs> That's right. They are daily paid employees. <coughs> They're daily paid employees, you see. <coughs> now, how come, how come all, the, all your workers say you ill-treat them? Well, I don't know about this. I don't but know that's what they are saying. He says he, uh, he was beaten <coughs> and uh, you set dogs. You set dogs to him. What did you have to say? I say he was definitely not beaten, and the dogs no, were definitely... No, def not beaten. I mean... He, he, oh, he, he, was, he was bitten. He no. was bitten. Agaruma. Yeah. Yes. Agaruma. Right. Uh. He was bitten. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. By, by, yeah. Which, by which dogs? Let's see. Which dog? Sheba? Yeah. He says you were holding him here whilst the dogs were biting him. No. No, no. How long ago was this? Was once we not tamper in one. Is unpeef. When that in ah, he's most uncle put in tamper. My friends came here who are members of Zanu PF who came to play with me here. You say why do you play with Zanu PF people? Then you asked him to come to the office. As soon as he got into the office, your three dogs sat on him. Uh huh. And with your dogs were, were, were biting him, you did not pay him his money. He actually fought you physically. Wait a minute. Now, let's, let's go into... Is that true? No. Uh, now, can, can, I, can I give you this, this, this lot first? Yeah. Is this deal first? Yeah, he, yes. Now, on this... This is what blacks tend to see as a measure of justice being introduced at the workplace. It's what many whites see as an intrusion into private enterprise, which can only make industrial relations worse. In fact, the minister has no legal jurisdiction here. Do you want us to believe that leaders of this whole group here, he is guilty of, of stealing. A leader of this whole group here, your well, fellow your workers, like, like him, according, according, according to the police, 
Have, have, they, have they been tried? Uh, no, they haven't been tried now, yet. I don't you, think so. Now, I don't know. Now, Ask them, George, now, have you been tried yet? No. You haven't been tried yet? Was, when, when is your case coming up? Uh, no. I was yeah. found and guilty. You, were, you, you have been tried? You did only suspect me. That it, I have you, have you something. been tried yet? No. no. There yeah, I'm no in charge. I'm the police okay. can't even charge there's him no because case. there is no case. The, 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 the police no took him away? Yes. I asked him if he'd be charged if and he was charged. Call, if you call the police and say, take him away, he has stolen, they will take him away. But they they will. They will examine they him. Yes, then they will examine him, they will cross-examine him, and if they find there are no grounds they, to prosecute, they let him go. They, That's they, why they, 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 why, they, why, 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 why so much emphasis on firing people? Who else was dismissed? Now, I'm not, take, I'm not taking all this lot back, Mr. Minister. Oh, who I'll take some. I will take now, some. You take him, stand there. Right? You now, Mr. Him. Minister, on this, yes. this is... This let, is us, let us have a gentleman's agreement. Definitely. Otherwise, I shut down the place. Okay. Now, Mr. Minister... Now, I'm, I'm, giving, I'm giving you a very clear-cut offer. Right. I certainly agree with you. Right. right. This I'm, is I'm your private up. business. Yes, yes, yes. You either take back... Some people I am going to produce here, right. or I shut down the place from okay. tomorrow. Okay, okay. All okay. right, now okay. you take him back. Right. Right, no. uh, we are going to... You take him back from tomorrow, eh? Right. So right. I'll give him a job tomorrow. Uh, no, uh, Mr. Chairman... Why? Uh, uh, Why? Why? He, he, he is a bad grader. He's a, ba he's a bad grader. He's a bad grader? Yes. Uh, Zanzima, I'm going to go grade him. Yes, he's a, he's a bad grader. He's a bad grader. He's a bad grader. He has been grading for four years. Uh, not for what me I, for four what years. What I'm trying to do is to restore... Yes, I, I, the, certainly, I certainly agree the, with you. ...the confidence I certainly agree with you. in your workers, in you. All right. Uh, I want us to be very clear. You, as employer, you are entitled to them to work hard to earn the money that you pay them. I want but them to earn more that's than right, that. that's right. They have, if you are going to pay them, they must put a day's hard work here. Yes. But you treat them with respect. You treat them as human beings. Uh, you treat them as, as human beings. You treat them well. Yes. No, now, this business of your firing people left, right, and center, Yes. Is not consistent with what we are trying to do, which is we have talked about the spirit of reconciliation and so But can you explain? Why don't they, all of them, like you? Why? I don't know. <laughs> Perhaps I see you, they do the work. All of them don't, you don't have hard workers here at all? Oh, yes, very hard workers. But why here. don't those hard workers like you? Why? Mr. Minister, on this yeah, spot... No, no, no. Yeah. Unanimous. Yeah. Unanimous. I don't see the business continuing at all if uh, they carry on like this. I, th I think that this business will fold up. If you did close here, where would you go? What would you do? Well, I, I don't know about this. I've been seriously considering the, the UK, but when you have a look at the UK and have a look at the politicians, uh, some of them don't even know back from front. And uh, on this, uh, well, it's very, very hard to say. Perhaps the UK, perhaps South Africa. Maybe Brazil, I don't know. I'll just have to see where I can get myself fitted into. At least a thousand whites a month have left since independence, though few because of harassment or actual government policy. Most took their decisions in the early days because during the war they'd been encouraged to think there could be no future for them. For those who remain, their image of Mugabe has undergone a transformation from bete noire almost to great white hope. Each month, about 400 people, blacks and whites, are quietly going out to settle. But when whites quit, as with some farmers near Mtoko, it tends to get into the papers. Farmers leader, Jim Sinclair. Well, Mtoko's got a unique problem. They, um, they have an AP in the area, an assembly point. They have been harassed considerably. But there are only 23 white farmers in Mtoko anyway, uh, compared to the total white farmer population of about 6,000. So, although it's a tragedy for those uh, farmers concerned, it's by no means a tragedy for the industry or the country. So you're saying the press is exaggerating the problem? Yes, I'm saying that, yeah. I think that they, they're tending to go to the areas of concern and leaving the 
the uh, peaceful areas, which are by far the larger part of the country alone. And but that's, uh, to my way of thinking, is, uh, you know, it's an unreal situation, an unreal portrayal of, of our situation. You think, by and large, the Western press has got it wrong? Uh, well, from what I've seen in the Western press, yes. I have been overseas recently, and uh, the picture that they paint of this country is, doesn't bear any relation to the one that I know. And uh, we've got a whole lot of self-fulfilling prophecies around here, like the whites are all going to leave. Uh, well, we aren't going to leave. Uh, and um, it seems to me that a lot of uh, people would like to see us leave. I don't believe that many Zimbabweans want to see us leave, and I include my, my black compatriots in that remark. But uh, uh, pressure is on us, sure. But we'll, we'll survive it. We'll stay. And I, I, can see, I can see a fairly sticky two years ahead. But I think once we're through that, uh, we'll be fine. I believe that we have got to look to now, we've got to look to the future, and we've got to make a success of it. Andre Holland, MP. I represent, Mr. Spe Mr. Chairman, people who are farmers, people who have everything sunk into this country, people who are not going to leave, people who are determined to make a success. And I look optimistically towards the future. I give my best wishes to the Prime Minister and what he's trying to do and reassert once again my confidence in the future. Once again, Mr Chairman, may I thank all members for the compliments that they have showered on me. Uh, there are some people who really absorb the whole of my attention and then others that make my mind wander. I think about, you know, how good it is to have got to this position, but how sad that we have had to arrive at it through the loss of so much blood, and how mad, really, people can be to resolve through war something which we could have actually resolved through discussion. And, and seeing Mr. Smith there and Comrade Mugabe looking at each other and probably laughing at the same joke uh, is something which is really pleasing. You see, people have done now what we should have done a century ago. I have tremendous responsibilities, I know, but I know this is what we were fighting for. But do you have private doubts sometimes? No, uh, I'm always uh, a confident man. I never allow um, defeat to, uh, I mean, the th uh, thought of defeat to creep into my mind. I'm not a defeatist, as it were. Is it a lonely position, being Prime Minister, with all the problems, responsibilities you have? No, uh, in fact, my complaint is, is that I'm, uh, uh, I'm never lonely. I would like to be lonely sometimes. And I'm always in company, as you can see. Right. OK, fine. Guy. Okay. Our ability to direct events here in a way which yield peace and uh, lead to a greater economic development and the establishment of a non-racial society. If we can succeed, I think our success will promote uh, the endeavors of the people in South Africa to work towards the same goal. Um, in fact, if the history of this country were to be written, it should recall that once upon a time there was a party called the British of France which would not tolerate other parties or individuals opposed to it, ban parties, ban individuals, and remain only with puppet organizations around it. I think they are happy that they have an African government, that that government is one of their own making. I think they're prepared to wait. But, uh, of course, there is a limit to which people can wait for other benefits to which um, they know they are entitled.